Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today is a novelist and poet, and for the past 12 years, she has worked as a publicist, specializing in the promotion of small press authors. She also thrives as a certified meditation teacher and therapist at a holistic practice she founded in Limerick, Ireland. She currently divides her time between Wisconsin and Limerick. Intercessions is her debut novel. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Kathleen Yule. Thank you, Julia. So, so happy to be with you today. Kathleen, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think like a lot of people, I was, uh, I was writing, um, you know, always from the time I, I I could remember I was writing poetry and things like that. Always hoped to write a novel. And then life kind of got in the way. Um, had my kids. I was working and and just didn't really, you know, find the time. And then finally got back to it, was back to my poetry. And uh, a friend of mine who's a, a mystery writer uh, really encouraged me. He said, I think you've got a novel in you, Kathleen. Um, so I, I had no idea what I was going to write about initially, um, but I just started writing and uh, here I am. <laughs> well, you're living in a place that lends itself to poetry, I think, from the name of it. I'm very interested in learning how you established a business in Ireland and how you split your time between the U.S. and there. Well, my business was established in Wisconsin um, before I moved over to Ireland, and uh, I'd always loved Ireland, uh, you know, had visited, hoped maybe someday to live here, uh, but thought, well, you know, <laughs> that's never going to happen. Um, and then I ended up marrying a, a man who's an Irish citizen. So um, so he's been here. Um, his parents are from Ireland. He was born in Chicago. And uh so we're, we have family in both places. And uh, so I split my time now. That seems like the best of both worlds. I've always <laughs> wanted is. to visit Ireland. I've heard it's just one of the most beautiful countries in the world. It really is. Yeah. Well, once you wrote your first book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? I, I guess because I been working uh, in book promotion for quite a while. I chose to go the small press route. Um, I didn't really bother looking for an agent. I just felt that the odds were against debut authors there. Um, better to look once you have a book under your belt. Uh, so I chose a small press because I thought that the type of book that I was writing um, which is which is a thriller but also very character driven would have um, the best chance for press. Well, I have gotten hooked on thrillers. So tell us more about your inspiration for writing one. Well, I, you know, they always say you should write the kind of books you like to read. And I, you know, I do like thrillers. I, I read a lot of different things, but I've always liked thrillers, particularly psychological thrillers. I did not have any idea that was going to be the kind of book I was going to write. Um, but that's just kind of how it unfolded. Um, I, you know, was inspired by a, 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 a true event in, in our town when I was growing up. 
uh, just the kernel of the original idea uh, came from that. Um, but as I followed that story, it led me down the the path of the psychological thriller. Well, then how did you determine the plot? I'm definitely not a plotter. Um, so I really followed my characters. I knew that um, that I wanted to write about this girl who she wasn't the victim of the crime. She was more the witness of the crime. And I wanted to follow her story. And so as I did that, it unfolded. You have a couple of other jobs that you do as well as write. So how do you uh, structure your writing routine? Are you a morning person or a night person? How do you juggle all of your jobs? Well, I used to be a morning writer uh, when my kids were small. And over the years, it's shifted now with my with my business. I find it much easier to get my sort of administrative work done in the morning and then write in the afternoon. I never thought I'd be an afternoon writer, uh, but I find that once I get those other tasks out of the way for the day, it really frees me up um, mentally to to be with the book. Well, Kathleen, most writers just want to write. We don't want to promote ourselves, but you're a publicist. So does that make marketing easier for you? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it's different to be on this side of the equation. Um, I'm so used to promoting other people's work, but it does make it easier, I think, in the sense that I understand the process of what happens, you know, as a book is going through uh publishing and then the marketing, you know, one that needs to start um, and and the different steps and places to look for good fits. Uh, I have a little bit of an advantage there after 12 years of working for other authors. <laughs> Are there any specific tips for publicity that have worked for you personally or maybe something you tried that didn't work? I think a lot of authors are, are kind of told there's a set list of what you're supposed to do. Um, not everything works for every book. And I think if I had a tip for authors, it would definitely be look at your book, look at where your audience is, and then start to try and find promotional opportunities that are, that are going to reach that audience. You're not going to please everybody with every book. So just really kind of look to customize the fit of your promotion. And that's pretty much what I've always tried to do, you know, take the setting from the book and find opportunities maybe in those certain settings. I wrote one book about Texas. And so my launch party was, you know, in a barn and and I looked for for ways to promote it around the state as well. Yeah, that's perfect. Tell us a little bit about the passages that you've brought to share today and then read from your book so we can hear your tone and voice. Well, the passage I brought today um, is really, it's from the first chapter and it it's kind of encapsulates uh, my character, my main character, Corianne. Like, as I said, she's uh, been, you know, witness to a, a, a crime. She and her friend, best friend are walking to school one day and, um, only one of the girls makes it home after they're approached by a stranger. And this, as she grows up in the shadow of this event, um, her world, as you would guess, really becomes uh, a place of fear and darkness and distrust. So the passage that I've brought, uh, I think, helps kind of give a flavor for uh, how Corian sees the world after what she's been through. So where I pick up, she's finished thinking back to a, a book she was reading the night before when she fell asleep. Pushing that memory aside, I returned to the journal, scribbling as fast as I could before the dream fell apart. I stopped, my pen hanging just above the paper as I lifted my head to listen. A conversation in the hall, two women speaking rapidly, another language, Slavic by the sound and rhythm. Something was wrong, their words sounded so urgent, I wished I knew what they were saying. I crept from the bedroom, trying to hear. The voices were loud now, stopping right outside the door. I froze and listened. 
They talked over each other, their voices rising and becoming more insistent, even angry. Then nothing. A pause. Something said lower. Finally, I heard them move away down the hall, their voices and footsteps moving into the distance. It had been so long since I lived with other people, I had forgotten what it was like to have the sounds of other lives around me. The footfalls, deadbolts, and chains sliding home. Muffled conversations, bits of music, greasy, stale cooking smells. I didn't know their names and didn't care. They were a kind of company, even if we never spoke. The safe kind. I touched the door gently as the voices faded. There was a man who lived across the courtyard, our balconies hanging like a handshake, not yet fully extended. He was the closest thing to a friend here, though we never spoke. But once he caught me standing and staring from the glass door which opened onto the metal balcony. Strains of Bob Dylan were drifting out from his open door. I'd been so caught up in the beautiful way the music floated in the space between, I hadn't noticed he was watching me. Something pulled me back from where I had gone an unsettled feeling. I looked across and there he was, watching me from his doorway, a slight smile tugging at his mouth. I started to smile back in polite reflex, but I couldn't manage even that. It clawed up from my gut as it always did, that feeling from long ago. Oh, that was lovely. Your tension is there. You had us Thinking about where she's living, I could just see all of those different people and smell the kitchen smells. So that was lovely. Oh, thank you. And I love writing down uh, in her journal about the dream because so many of us do that. So many of us dream and want to get it into our books. I've interviewed so many people who wake up and have to scribble down their dreams because they work it into their writing. Yeah, that is interesting. I, I had not had that before this book, but I did find bits of my own dream life creeping in. <laughs> I, sometimes I dream so vividly that for days afterwards, I think it really happened. It stays inside me. Mm -hmm. Do you ever Google yourself or read reviews? And if so, how do you deal with the bad or the good ones? Um, I try not to Google myself unless it's, you know, for, for the business or, you know, making sure that my website's displaying properly. Um, I, you know, I'm not a fan of reading reviews. Um, I, I try and encourage my clients not to put too much emphasis there. Um, you know, when you get a really good one, that's great. And you want to get it out. You want to, you know, share it with the world. But reviews can be... Um, they can be a bit uh, uneven. Um, some reviewers are more thorough than others in, in their reading of the book. Some just mainly summarize. And, you, you know, and again, like I said, in terms of finding your publicity uh, avenues, you're, you're not going to please everybody. So your book won't be for everyone. And you kind of have to trust that it's going to find the readers that are meant to have it in their hands. I believe that as well. I'm the people who have reached out to me after reading my book, you know, have been um, just a joy to listen to. And, and they're people who aren't your, your friends or your family. They're strangers who found your book. And that means so much when it touches someone. I think that's the legacy that we leave. Exactly. And I, I think, you know, like you're saying, when you are finished with the book and you, you, it's published and it's out there, it really doesn't belong to you anymore in a way. And it, it becomes whatever it will become to the people who pick it up. How about your editing process? Did you edit something out that didn't make the cut in the book? How did you handle your editing process? Well, I did quite a lot of editing. Um, and I would say if I, I edited out actually the entire first ending, I did, I just, I, I ran it past a, a, a friend who's a writer and a reader and uh, he, he made some comments about it and I wasn't entirely happy with it. And I really sat with it a long time. And then I decided, no, this isn't, this isn't right. The characters, the characters themselves didn't seem happy with how it ended. So I rewrote the entire ending. <laughs> That's being committed to the quality of your book. Well, I think you have to be. Um, 
you have to accept that your first idea isn't always your best one. And sometimes we spend too much time, I think, um, worrying about what other people might think when we're writing. You really just have to get all that out of your head and follow follow your instincts on where you think the story needs to go. You know, characters in our book sometimes become larger than life, especially if the book is picked up to be in a streaming service or in a movie. These characters live long past our writing them. And so I'm always interested in how our writers choose their characters' names. How did you choose yours? Yeah, that's, I'm never totally sure. I mean, sometimes it makes sense, maybe uh, regionally, uh, you know, certain names might fit better than others. Um, but I think it always, it always starts with my main character. And um, I really kind of have a sense of who they are before I name them. So yeah, I don't, it's really kind of a weird organic process I go through. Um, I might occasionally like pop out on the on the internet and check to see what a name means. Um, but generally, I have kind of a sense of uh, maybe the syllables, um, something about that name that is evocative of the location. Yeah, and I wrote in my first book, I named a character who um, eventually became the first lady in the White House. And someone said, oh, you can't name her that because there's a show about a Southern woman who is first lady. And that was her name. And I said, really? I've never seen that show. So sometimes names are out there and you don't even know it when you choose them. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, you don't know if you were exposed to it, you know, and just didn't consciously, you know, remember it or if it's just coincidence. You mentioned doing a research for for the names. Do you have to do a lot of research for your for your writing? Do you do it as you begin or as you go along? Uh, generally, for for this book for intercessions, I didn't do I didn't have to do a lot of research, but I tend to do it as I go along, unless there's something about the location that I really uh, need to know first. Um, but I, I tend to write and then you know, do the research, look things up as I go, if I need to. What is the setting for this book? You didn't place it in Ireland, did you? I didn't. This one is placed in the Midwest of the U.S. Well, do you have any other books in you? Will you be writing about your time in Ireland? I am. I am working on a second book now, and and part of it does take place in Ireland. Oh, nice. So, and that's a challenge um, that I'm finding uh, not being from Ireland originally uh, to be, you know, true to the language and the people here and really make sure I get it right. One of my daughters li lived outside the country for six years and, and I'm just so intrigued by those of you, those expats who live all over the world, because I always wanted to go other I, I've traveled a lot but I've never lived outside the country I just wonder how that works and how you split your time well you know I think being from the Midwest uh weather has a lot to do with it in terms of how I split my time because I I do not miss the Midwestern winters so Ireland is a uh, is rainy but a much nicer place to be in the winter um and you know of course I see family uh, back in the States. Uh, I have, I have family in, in Wisconsin, also in Arizona. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I really thought it would be harder, uh, to split my time than it has been. Uh, I, I settled in here quite quickly and I really, really do find like I have two homes now. <laughs> That's very encouraging to those who want to give that a try. Yeah. And it's really, you know, um, you just have to, you know, be, be adventurous, be open. Um, and I find, especially here in Ireland, people were so helpful when I moved over and as I was settling in and answering what were probably obvious questions for them, but, um, it really helped me find my legs. Well, after the movie PS, I love you came out. I don't know if you remember the movie, but all of us wanted to marry someone with that Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> 
Who does a nice accent? Yeah, it really is (laughs) my favorite. What was the best money you've ever spent as a writer? You know, funny enough, it was buying myself a bigger monitor um, because I had been working on a small laptop for quite a while. And as I was editing my book, uh, I just decided this is crazy. You know, as I got older, my eyes got older. Um, it just, I was like, now I just need to upgrade. So, so now I have a, a big, you know, Dell monitor and that has made editing so much better and just checking your page layout, everything, best money I ever spent. <laughs> I agree. I do love a larger monitor. I don't know how people take their laptops to coffee shops and, and uh, not have a mouse and, <laughs> and work I can there. Do it, but <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'm too distracted by all the people around me. I have to have a very quiet place to keep my thoughts on going to the paper. What does writing success look like to you personally? Well, I mean, I think we talked about that a little bit already. I, I really believe in um, in a book finding its audience. Um, I think you know, there, there are very few overnight sensations in, in publishing. And I, I think there's some crazy statistic about, you know, uh, you know, 10 in every, you know, 10,000 books is going to become a bestseller. So I am realistic that way. So for me, I think uh, having intercessions find, you know, find readers who really um, embrace the characters and respond to it. And, and maybe even, you know, help, that the book would start conversations. Um, you know, I think I'd be happy with that. That's the way I feel too. And and I was so thrilled when one of my granddaughters picked up the book and chose it as, as one of her high school books that she could read, you know, to, to do a book report. And she said, not everybody's grandmother has written a book. So that thrilled me. That was success for me. Very true. Yeah. What does your family think about you being a writer? Oh, they're very supportive. Um, I have I have two sons who have always thought it was pretty pretty cool to have a mom who was a writer. Um, so they've they've always been kind of my biggest fans. My husband uh, has written a lot in you know academic kind of work. He's very supportive. Um, my sisters, uh, we were writing as kids together. They no longer write, but uh, I think they they were a little skeptical. I think at first, maybe uh, that I was really going to do this, but they're they couldn't be happier for me now. Are there any specific tips that you can tell um, our audience about that helped improve your writing journey? Any specific books or seminars or writing retreats or groups that you can recommend? Well, I tend to be a pretty solitary writer myself. I have I have been part of writing groups over the years. I've done um, I was part of a poetry workshop uh, for a couple of years uh, when my kids were small. I found that helpful uh, to get some feedback, and especially because I hadn't been writing a lot um, for a while, and that was helpful for getting you know getting my confidence back uh, because I had taken time off of writing while I my kids were very small. Um, I do recommend, uh, you know, if you if you write in a particular genre, um, children's book writers, for instance, there's uh, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. They have a chapter in every state, I think. Um, those, if, if you have a specific genre that you write in, uh, there are usually organizations that are, you know, people, people in your same wheelhouse, um, and they offer just so much in terms of editing support and uh, helping you find reviews and different outlets. I, I think that's that's a great outlet. Um, but just you know, finding other writers and and being willing to to share some of you know some of your pages and uh, you know get some feedback. But don't don't obsess about what other people think about your writing. I just you know don't write with the workshop over your shoulder. That's maybe one of the worst things you can do, but it, it is helpful. A lot of people need the community. And if you look at, um, at your universities, oftentimes there are uh, lifelong learning groups, uh, you know, writers who come together that way. So 
I agree. I, I think that joining professional organizations and finding other writers in our genre, we, we have such a generous writing community and everyone is willing to share. It's the only industry I've ever been involved in that truly will share tips and, and help you along the way. So uh, I think that's great to be involved with our groups to volunteer and to get to know other writers. It's always very helpful. Yeah, they're really a generous group, I find. Yeah. You talked about your second book. How long will it be before that one is finished? Have you set any deadlines for yourself? I try not to set real tight deadlines for myself, but I would say um, I'm hoping to have a finished, you know, good finished draft uh, by the spring. So that it's, it'll be a, almost a year. Um, but this one has uh, required a bit more research, so it slowed me down a little bit. Well, they say that we need at least three books out in the world to start really earning any money. So maybe you'll have a series or our third book coming along next. Yeah, I think this next book has series potential. So it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> I'm I'm writing it with that, you know, an eye on that. So That's what I did with this second book is I thought that uh, it's the fifth daughter of Thorn Ranch. It's a generational story. I thought I could go back and begin with the first daughter and bring it forward, or I could go forward from the fifth daughter to the sixth daughter. So mm -hmm. I think we we can lay the groundwork to to be able to continue in either direction. Yeah, definitely. Once you kind of build that world, and if if you have that in mind when you're when you're writing, you can leave yourself opportunities. Definitely. Well, Kathleen, as always, our last interview question is, our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have any advice for writers 50 and above? I would say be fearless. I mean, really don't listen to the people who say it's too late or, you know, just do it. Do it. If you are, if you are really called to write, then write and you'll get it done. There's so many avenues for publishing now. Um, I just really encourage you to just go for it. That's great advice today. And we just appreciate your being with us all the way from Ireland today. And we hope that your journey continues and that you're continuing to be successful in promoting your own clients as well as your own books. So thank you so much. And we can now count you among our authors over 50. Thanks, Julia. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.